Hi, my name is Virlana Tkach, and I direct Yara Arts Group from La Bama Experimental Theater in New York. Uh, tonight's event, Ukrainian American Poets Respond. Most of the participants uh, will be reading their work in English, while several will read in Ukrainian. Dobry večer, ja Virlana Tkach, hudožni kirimnik Yara Mistečkoj Grupy, ukrainski dilnic v New Yorku. Sjohodni uh, me počinajem um, нашу серію вірші українських американських поетів. Деякі будуть читати свої вірші по-українськи, але більшість з нас пише по-англійськи і будуть так свої вірші читати. The music you heard at the top was by Julian Kitasti. If you'd like a program with a list of participants, you can download it from Yara's homepage, www.yaraartsgroup.net. В нас маленький ритуал, починаємо кожну подію дзвінком. We have a little ritual. We start each of our virtual shows, actually each of our shows in general. We say, I say, welcome to Yara Arts Group, dedicated to the theater and all the poetry, music, and images that inspire it. Today, Yara is not at La Mama, but in virtual space. <laughs> Please welcome Olena Jennings from Poets of Queens, who who curated today's event. Welcome to Ukrainian American Poets Respond. Thank you to Yara Arts for hosting us and to Poets of Queens. You'll hear from nine poets today, all with a personal connection to Ukraine. Now we welcome our first poet. Hi, my name is Stash Luchkiv, and uh, I'm in Krakow now. I'm originally from New York, so I write in English. And uh, I'm gonna read a couple of poems basically about the difficulty of, I, I've written these since the, the invasion began, and uh, the difficulty of watching everything and without being able to, almost that feeling of powerlessness of not being able to talk to people, help people. And um, and in, in my case, it, it was strong enough. I live in Italy, so I decided to come closer to the border to see uh, if there was anything I could do, if I, you know, whether it was just to uh, help the re refugees or you know, just see what happens. Um, but anyways, the, the, first, uh, the first poem is called Rage. We scroll through salvos of grim information. We watch the images till our temples hurt. We listen to the curses meant to make sure we know. And with each scream, our stiff fingers itch to pull some trigger that might lip, lift us up from years of indifference, might slip us across the border between slack-jawed paralysis and righteous rage. So we witness how they wail to move us into action while we wither in doubt or exalt in our anger, aspiring to a glory, because we are human, and being so human, so we can fight off the fury consuming us, fight with still deeper ire rage and uh, the second poem again ukrainian based uh, it's called black earth the earth over there is black as black as the world's mother and i am son 
She feeds me at dawn and watches my bonds come undone and fills me with longing to scour her skin. The earth over there will soon be cratered like faces disfigured beyond recognition, shell-shocked and haunted by glory's silent shadows, seething men and lip-bitten women, eager to mete out revenge. The earth over there is wet, as wet as a fresh woman's face at the sound of a strange woman's voice. And I fear for the child, like a child unable to explain how we can cease to exist. The earth over there, it runs with us as it's run with blood from the world's first plow and we'll keep running toward the dire glow at the end of the road to that limitless step. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Lila de la Borja. I'm reading from New York City. And I'll be reading excerpts from my Ukraine notebook from uh, 2017. Punkt. Today, I helped out at the railroad punkt in Kyiv, the place where soldiers meet to catch the train that takes them to the war. They told me that they had to pay for the tickets themselves. We gave them sandwiches, coffee or tea, sweets and fruits, and little talismans to keep in their pockets some sized dolls with big boobs, blue and gold bracelets, or wooden crosses to wear on a string around their necks. For some reason, a lot of soldiers wanted to talk with me when they learned that I was an American. They seemed to consider it a blessing of some kind, a good luck charm. Kolya is an artillery gunner, father of two from Chernihiv. Tonight he is very drunk and sweaty. The bones under his eyes are burnished, eyes hollowed, bloodshot, squished, his face blackened and blotched red. I've got a bad feeling about this tour, he told me. The anxiety in that waiting room gelled with intensity. It was mobbed with 50 or 60 soldiers waiting for the train to take them to the front. I had to say something that would reassure these soldiers that they will come out of the war alive. That's what they wanted to hear, needed to hear. So that's what I gave them. Very quickly, a line started to form in front of me. Tie the bracelet on me. It will keep me alive. Kiss me before I go. It will keep me alive. Put your arms around me. It will help me survive. Avdiyuvka. Uh, Avdiyuvka was uh, devastated by missiles in 2016. Uh, fired by Russian troops that had destroyed uh, and occupied nearby Donetsk city, which was just a few kilometers away. There is no leftover food in Avdiivka. Scraps are put out on the curb for animals who cower and look at you sideways, bones sticking out. They sag and press to the ground with each tired step, just like the people who are still living here. The apartment where I'm staying is right across the fields that are littered with mines. As soon as I arrived, I was told not to walk there. The missionaries took me in. There, there was nowhere else to stay. They don't lock their door. This more than anything else surprised me. One night when there was no shelling, we watched Sound of Music together, dubbed in Russian. Four ladies eating popcorn stretched out on a queen size bed. They borrowed the apartment from a family who had run away during the onslaught. Luda is always thinking ahead. Chased and displaced people will do that. Today, they may kill us, she told me matter-of-factly. 
I must be dressed well. Her cascading mane of blonde hair skims her shoulders. Yuda and the other missionary ladies make a point of dressing nicely every day so that the separatists can't call them bums when they're killed. The lake. The missionaries and I went on foot to the lake, a man-made lake to unwind. It was a long walk from city center across the railroad tracks into the rural area with single family homes, cottages. There were many people at the lake in bikinis, fat and slim, eating sprats and oil, drinking homemade vodka, Ukrainian pop music blaring from the snack bar, colorful umbrellas all along the sandy beach. Nice place to go in the middle of a war. If it wasn't for all the missiles flying from the east, landing behind the bulge at the edge of, at the, edge of the lake. Big sign says, no swimming allowed. Of course, people are swimming. They paid 10 hryvni to go here. You can better go in a swim. Suddenly, loud sounds. Of boom, boom, every minute or so, and missiles whistling. No one flinched or even turned their head. As the time passed, more and more whistling than booms, maybe one or two kilometers away, no more. Then black clouds rising from behind the bulge. Something was hit just beyond the lake, behind a little bump in the terrain. I saw a woman I met earlier at the high school graduation I was invited to when I arrived. She sang so beautifully from her belly to serenade me, welcome me to Avdiyuvka. She and two girlfriends and her husband are on the beach, blankets, laughing, eating sprats out of a can, sausage, bread, and drinking wine. I come over to say hello to them. Did you tell Trump hello for me? She's a bit tipsy. She's been asking me that ever since we met. Suddenly, <clears throat> boom, boom, black smoke. No big deal again. No one reacted. The missile falls right behind the swell of land on the edge of the small lake. Why do they keep shelling that same spot over and over again? It occurs to me that Ukrainian soldiers must be there. The separatists have been bombing this old section of Avdiivka a lot, home of ordinary people, many old people. I think they want to take over this recreational area is why. They want it for themselves. Everyone knows that many separatists live in Avdiivka. They go back and forth to the front from here. It's walking distance. They come home on the weekend and return to the front on Monday or whenever they rotate, like a job. That's why they're not really shelling the center anymore. They're aiming for this rural area. Oi, Christina is becoming a pain in the ass. I don't like her. I think she's following me, calling me often, wants to meet. I don't trust her. She's originally from Moscow, but now lives in Barcelona, so she says carries a camera with her all the time, claims to be a photographer. I heard that one before from other people who were snooping into my business. I suspect she's been sent from Moscow to look in on me. The shooting gets worse at the lake. The whistling of missiles, then boom, boom. More whistles, then boom. Again whistles, boom, boom. But we don't see them. We just hear them and see the black smoke behind the bulge. You could swim there, it's that close. Now the people begin to panic, start collecting their things, blankets. They don't even bother dressing. The missionaries were not in a hurry though, said they still wanted to stay. The music in the food pavilion was playing loudly. The missionaries took it all in stride, though, confident no bomb was going to fall on the lake's disco. Christina, the spy, asked my acquaintances if there's room for two of us in their car. The three women, big ladies, and one husband pile in. I sit on someone's lap. Missiles flying. <whistles> Boom. Black smoke. Everyone's talking at once, telling others what to do what should be done, what not to do. We're all squished and the husband starts the car and drives it straight into deep sand. The car sinks, stuck deep. More than half the wheel is buried in sand. We all spill out of the car. 
we try to dig it out with our hands, doesn't work. I call Sirhi. Christina, for some reason, is yelling at me not to call him, tries to grab my phone out of my hand. He is head of the Simikia here, civilian military affairs. But frankly, I don't think he does much of anything other than patrol the streets and beat up drunkards. I've taken strolls with him in the evening. I tell him the situation. People are in a panic. The driver drove the car into deep sand, can't get out, and they're shooting pretty heavily. <clears throat> Black smoke. Perhaps you can come and help dig us out, help evacuate people out of here. This is your job, is it not? He sighed loudly, a give me a break kind of sigh. What was I thinking? The Simikia are made up of former militia that was fired throughout Ukraine after Poroshenko was kicked out. They just redeployed some of them to the war zone. The missionaries walk over, perfectly calm, hook up the car with rope and pull us out. My acquaintances dropped Christina off at a checkpoint because she is staying with the Simiki somewhere not in my direction. The Simiki didn't want to give me a place to stay when I asked them, thank goodness. I was glad to be rid of her. I come home to the missionary's apartment and as usual, the door is not locked. I was glad to see calm and peaceful Luda, whom everybody admires. She is the oldest of the missionaries here, but still much younger than me. I told her about the drama at the lake. Suddenly, who walks into the apartment? Christina. She comes in with Tanya saying, don't worry, I'm only here to charge my phone and transfer some files. She could have gone home to do that, to the Simica. I suspect she just wanted to see where I'm staying. It really now begins to look suspicious. Her coming to Avdiivka, finding me, coming to the apartment, making some excuse, always wanting to get together. It's really beginning to annoy me and she sees this. Next day, I've got the stiffest neck. The fly in my room bothers me more than the sound of bombs. There was something. There was supposed to be a ceasefire to collect crops. Boom. I'm sitting on my bed and listening on a pivot of my whole anatomy, compelled to give form to sound to each round of fire. What for? Why this obsession with sound as if I could snuff out the bombs if only I could fit them into my mouth? The building shook, incoming. Damn fly. Returning from the front. I'm riding back to Pokrovsk in a military ambulance. Up front sits a tight-lipped commander. In back I sit with a handsome medic who had been wounded but not badly. He has a nice, full, ruddy beard and glassy blue eyes. This time I want to sit on the stretcher in case they smoke and open the windows again, because the last time when I sat on the bench in the back, the wind blew straight in my face. I caught a bad cold that way on the way over to Aldiuka, and now an earache I didn't want to make worse. The stretcher was threadbare, metal parts protruding into my rear end. When you know it, on the way back, no one smoked, so the window remained closed. I could have sat on a nice padded bench. I look down at my feet and I see I'm not wearing any socks. Shit. I looked over at the medic and said, I forgot my socks. Full of lament, I locked eyes with him and suddenly, suddenly we both burst out into laughter. The absurdity of the regret of leaving my socks at the front, as if socks even mattered. We both laughed so hard. Who the hell cares about socks? And we were laughing how perfect it really was to return from war with only your socks missing. I wanted to kiss him and laugh, embrace him and kiss him and laugh. It would keep us alive. My name is Alana Jennings, and I'm reading from Astoria, Queens. I'm going to read two poems that um, 
address my connection with Ukraine. This silence. There was silence then in the Kiev apartment, forming a soft layer into which I could stick a pin. I walked to the department store in my heeled shoes until my feet bled. I bought a player to listen to all the cassettes to break the silence, especially when I was having friends over for pasta and freshly gathered mushrooms. Instant coffee afterwards and a cigarette on the balcony, imagining the sounds of the cassettes even when they weren't playing. There was silence then, pierced by a fish bone in a restaurant where friends sang about an evening in the capital. Now silence is pierced by air raid sirens. Now silence is full of partings. What we call it. The village has turned into a sleepy suburb. I look into the woman's window and see the living room. Her body stretches to reach a glass. She fills it with warm tea. Her lips fill a lemon wedge. She cringes with joy. This is the village where the tiny pig that my grandmother loved so much was stolen. And her life was stolen. In another country, she tried to remember. She brushed her mother's silk scarf across her cheek. She tried to make her body remember. She reached into a container of flour to feel something. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks so much to Alana and Virulana for organizing and thanks to, um, it's an honor to be here and thanks to everybody for tuning in. I am Christina Lutsenko, and I'm reading from Long Island, uh, New York, and I'm going to read two poems. The first one is Imagine Belonging. When he was a boy, my father practiced it again and again, wanting to perfect his new American signature. L's swoop like unfinished eights, wandering off at the O, a studied carelessness, a practiced future. Some little things, if you do them long enough, amount to great things. At least this is what he taught me. He taught me that yes, warriors are clever in all things, but strong doesn't mean big and the struggle doesn't stop at your door. He taught me that melodies, lyrics, whole songs won't be forgotten if we sing them in waking and dreaming hours. Do you hear it when your eyes are closed, your heart's beating history? And so in the dream, I listen to your voice. Your voice is like a holding place. We sing and wait for the clouds to gather and we measure time, not by anger or sadness or fear, but by the sublime and defiant tune rising, a repertoire we have always known, of course, a river flowing, flowing, a nation inside us rising, wild and bright like the moon. And the second poem is actually, it's a, uh, a poem by, I'm gonna read it from um, Oksana Zabushka, one of my favorite Ukrainian poets. And this was from a collection called From Three Worlds. Um, and this one is List Izdachi. Letter from the Summer House. Hello, dear. The land is all rusty again with acid rain. Blackened cucumber vines jut from the earth like burnt wires. I'm not sure about the orchard this year. I've been meaning to get in there and clean it up. But to tell you the truth, I'm scared of those trees. 
I get this feeling when I walk between them that I'm very close to a place in the grass where a corpse lies, something teeming with worms, something hot and laughing. And I get nervous over sounds. The day before last, a cry rose up from deep in the garden, like a meowing or a single grating branch or a goose being strangled. It had that despair. Do you remember the elm summers ago? The one that was struck by lightning and stood there, a gigantic, a gigantic charred bone? Sometimes I think it still lords over everything, infecting the plants with rabid madness. I don't know how crazy trees act. Maybe they shake off their roots and run amok. In any case, I keep an ax by the bed. At least the butterflies are mating. We should see caterpillars soon. The neighbor's daughter across the way gave birth, a boy long overdue. He had, he had hair and teeth already. Maybe he's a mutant too, because yesterday, nine days old, he shouted, shut off the sky. Then he grew quiet, hasn't said a word since. Otherwise, he's the picture of health. So there it is. If you get a chance to come this weekend, maybe Sunday, bring me something to read in a language I don't know. The ones I call mine are exhausted. Kisses your O. Um, hi, um, I am Oksana Lutsashina. I am right now in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm going to read two poems in the English translation. So the first one is called The Cat, and it has been translated by Oksana Maksimchuk and Max Rosochinsky. Father asked, write a poem about me. How I was young, how I was, period played the guitar, chased a soccer ball in the field, bouncing it with my head high in the sky. How I returned home to our apartment that smelled of oatmeal and Sunday laundry, with a tapestry hanging on the wall. On the tapestry, a man and a woman, woven in red, ride a pair of black horses. No, father, I kept saying, I can't. I don't know how to write about it. It's too close. It's too close, and so it doesn't seem real. All right, he sighed, and went back to work, exchanged his fedora for a baseball hat, his guitar for a church choir, and soccer for a car. Nobody cooked oatmeal anymore, but the tapestry stayed. And then he stopped asking. He realized that I'll never write about him. But we have a cat, he chuckled, write about a cat. A red cat with white spots, a red cat with a white voice. If I don't make it into your writing, at least let the cat remain woven out of air. And the second one um, has been translated by Askold Melnichak. I am lucky my parents were peasants, sturdy stock and stout bones. Had they been like me, they wouldn't have made it. Had they been like me, I wouldn't be here. On roads where ashes roil with dust, where bodies bloom in the rain, where the dead blossom of youth froze for days and for a few hours, no one was old. The world was all wounded youths. Why did my grandparents survive? Was it because they felt the burden of generations of the unborn? Of those to come in five, in 30, in 50 years? And those who died, they were like pruned branches, light and free. And only on my father's side, the cancer of legacy, women's tears like women's fists, proud heads, which always fall first. These were women unused to standing for long because the veins on their legs exploded, who were unable to weep long hours without going blind or mad. You had to know how to do everything. Tend wounds, bake bread, dig trenches. Nobody taught them. They had to learn for themselves. And they wrote poems. Not like before, shorter now, 
nearly wordless because they no longer had metaphors, only the clay and the sun. Hi, I'm Svenja Orlowski, and I'm reading uh, for you from Marshfield, Massachusetts, south of Boston. Um, thank you, Olena and Vrilana, for curating and organizing this reading and for inviting me to take part. Um, it's an honor and a privilege, and thank the rest of you readers and everybody out there who's listening. Um, I'm going to read three poems and one short translation. The first poem I'm going to read is to honor um, a friend of mine, the late Ed Hogan, which Christina, you, you mentioned with the Three Worlds from Three Worlds uh, anthology. And I wanted to bring him into the reading because um, if he were alive, he'd be probably involved in this reading and he'd be doing so much to bring Ukrainian literature to the forefront. So um, this poem was dedicated to him and it was unfortunately written on the occasion of his tragic canoe accident in which he and his companion and her nine-year-old son perished. And this poem is called Elegy for Ed Hogan. Black tree shadows along the paved road are a safe lake, intertwined with light, a rustling of leaves undressing, eager for winter, the cold they won't feel, anticipating ground. I'm going nowhere in particular today. I'm three o'clock passing on to four. Among others whose hearts pump anonymously at their own doorways that swell with excitement, occasional adventure, pack knife, the apple forgotten. I was nowhere last night in particular, breathing in my room, dreaming of you, taking off your jacket, untying your shoes for you, making you lighter, pushing back the water. Today, leaves scattered from trees fall from autumn skies, from four o'clock passing on to five, from anything meant to hold or save us. This next poem is um, after a poem of, uh, written by Natalka Bielosarkiewicz. And um, it's titled November and it's inspired by her beautiful long meditative poem um, of the same title. So November. I turn the key, enter my room, dark corners welcome me. Muddy taste of rain, leaves taken into hands. I could throw my life away and it scarcely make a sound. Shall I go there? where tiles of light lie in the fields, to the cobweb's maze, blood illuminated words, to where a stranger removes his gloves, traces his finger from vein to heart. Water revives with early snows, washes fat roots beneath sidewalks. Uncertain knock, the glass lamp lit, I could choke on light that has yet to pass. And um, Ed, Ed Hogan had introduced me to Natalka's work back when the anthology was coming together. And the past two years, I've had the privilege of working with my co-translator, um, translator, Ali Kinsella, um, on Natalka Bielosokiewicz's poem with this book, Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow, which came out this past November. So November seems to be a theme here um, of last year. And I just wanted to read one poem in English. Bridge, the air is as still and hot as my body, arch like a bridge over a river. It's so quiet, the nightingales must be drinking their own black alcohol. No sounds, only color and shades spread out across the water. Face up, that's how it was with me, evenings as glorious as spirits. There are memory catastrophes, they collapse into signs, half tones, details of blocks, construction of rail, inflows of blood, formulas for love. I don't remember the color of eyes, but their expression still here, when a devastating pulse of extreme temperature drops from above onto the bridge. Um, the last poem I'm going to read um, is from my book, Bad Harvest. 
and it takes as its subject the 1994 Winter Olympics figure skating. And as all of you know, but some in the audience might not, this is three years after Ukraine had declared her independence. And um, the world was focused very much on Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. And I, I wanted to read this poem because I couldn't, I was really taken by the uncanny parallel with watching the Olympics this year, in particular the figure skating, uh, and then seeing that picture of Putin just sort of sitting there and realizing that in his mind, he knew that this catastrophic attack on Ukraine was about to happen while his own figure skaters sort of rise and fell. Um, the, the title is after Emily Dickinson's Hope was a thing is a thing with feathers. Um, so this is my response poem written in pantoon form. It's called Hope was a thing with pink feathers, Oksana Bayul. Hope was a thing with pink feathers circling Olympic ice. Despite her tender years, a woman of great composure. Circling Olympic ice for gold, Ukraine, we could hardly believe our ears. This woman of great composure, triple Lutz flip loop world premiere. Ukraine, we could hardly believe our ears, representing the once orphaned and lost. With a triple Lutz flip loop world premiere, how much could one girl cost? Representing the once orphaned and lost, a dash of Broadway thrown in for good cheer. How much could one girl cost? Kerrigan, steely, no fame fetters yet or fear. A little Broadway never heard a routine. Then gold, Oksana cried and cried and cried. Kerrigan gauged her steely dream. It's taking 20 minutes for officials to find. Oksana cried and cried and cried. Let's say triple cried. Post-Soviet tears no longer held to ransom. It took 20 minutes for Olympic officials to find Ukraine's national anthem. As Nancy Kerrigan's eyes demanded ransom, her Vera Wang swan about to be pronounced dead, still no copy of Ukraine's national anthem, maybe they play Russia's instead. No flowers, swans, or poppies red, at home we held our breath, maybe they'd fly Russia's eagle instead, but damn, this gold was our destined wealth. At home we waited, held our breath. Where was our anthem, our homeland tether? Slava Baha, this could be our wealth. Our hope was a thing with pink feathers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Rovakovich and I'm going to read, I'm, I'm in New York City. And I'm going to read uh, in Ukrainian and in English, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, the first poem I wrote a long time ago. It was in the summer of 1991, literally on the eve of Ukraine gaining um, independence. And I feel that maybe it is appropriate. Uh, it has two parts. And the second poem I'm going to read in English. Um, it also has two parts. It's a rather personal poem, but refers to March and February, which are kind of relevant months, uh, I suppose. So, Virš ekologično istorečni. Ne govorite teorije, bo teorija prodalasja. Ne govorite ničoho. Slova to vorohe, Julipa. Odin. Kole prekladaju slova do tvojih ust, Ukrajino, one kotjecja bezmovnim zhustkom po zritih boroznah tvojho lica. I što nam iz tebe, jak što ljudstvo vyrizalo diru v nebi i sonce tavruje nam škiru? I što nam iz tebe, jak što vjušti iz dvoke su v ugleću varimo ne liše sebe, ali i riki, pola, risi, morja? I što nam iz tebe, jak što zamis često iz svički povitrja, zavijazimo je sobi na šeji na mesto kislogo došću. I što nam iz tebe, jak što zvrštka tvojej golovi znjali zelenu rjesnu čuprinu, zališivši sevej čup čornobeljskoho demu. Dva. Vseš, te dihaj, dihaj. 
wilno, pewno grudo, prozoro, wczesia wymowlate sące, kruglo, rad, disno, stynio. Zapytajte rysikosy w stypu, jak szczę roste, wymowaj lice u dni pri, jak szczobin, szczę tecze, lubuj się czarnym morem, doki wono szczę twoje, holuby z piwą lisy, doki jeszcze zeleni. Taki nie studiło się tobie natiągnuty czas na spisy stolić. Historia stała na pił drodzy i mu podriapana plastynka w staromu gramofonie i kajecia na zwuku U. So my second poem is titled Two Monologues. One, early March monologue. Night, snow outside, white, lonely New York knocks on the door. I don't answer. I wrap myself in your words like a warm, cozy shawl and feel carefree. It's quiet and still. Just from time to time, the street begins to speak in a passing car. In absence, there's a certain gravity a word not thoroughly explained that's hanging above our distance. You'd like to open this word like a book and who will guess what's on the final page? I'm falling asleep, not having read it to the end. And it's real winter outside the window. Two, mid-February monologue. And why do you need to open the door to the entangled past? The door has been grated too long with the heavy padlock of bygone days and a grimly rusted key. Kiev in mid-February 2010. Alluring in transluted frost and corrupt politics unexpectedly brings your blossoming smile as if it is a dessert in a strange bowl out of which sham warm through the sun slides down like snow from the sloping roof. One chat about everything over a cup of tea. Easy to talk about politics. It's cheap and does not oblige. Yet there's no desire to talk about ourselves. Too many winters have flown to the sea. Too much grass has been burned in the sun, though still. Why do I want dessert so much? And I didn't mention that that's, uh, these poems were translated but by Svetlana Beddash. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Oksana Rosenblum um, and um, I'm gonna be reading a poem in Ukrainian. Uh, I'm in New York City and um, I'm really glad and honored to be part of this reading. Um, I wrote this poem just um, a few weeks back when the war started, and it's dedicated to two Ukrainian po poets that I am feeling connected to right now in the moment, to Mariana Kianowska and uh, Ritsko Chubai. Так, наче щось всередині раптом зламалось. Чи двигун, чи барометр, чи Бог його зна. Вийшло з ладу, зашпортилось у просторі сну. Ніби частина серця мого відлетіла, з шорохом в кут закутилась. Я ловила руками, губами її ловила, не знайшла. Ой, матінку, що ж вона буде? Ой, татусі, куди ж це воно двигтить, гримотить, ніжками перебирає, крильцями тріпоче, поривається, тупцює, розвертається, валить, наїжджає, скажено гарчить, всміхається, по-диявольськи зубами клацає і ди, ди, дихати не дає. Наче забулося все, що було, сталося давно і не дуже, хочу до тебе я друже, Руку свою присекти. Вийшла на ганок я зранку, ой, леле, сукню весільну провідать. Що ж мені сукня, ой, леле, коли вже шиються нараменники, 
Лаштуються гармати, біда насуває з усіх боків. Летіти лелем по траві древній, Повсти дурепою у тлустій олії, Молитися мовою на марних бжичок, В тилу тулубом тіла торсати, борсати, Клацати, мацати, брязкати, гаркати, Нявчати, кричати, дуріти, марніти, Говорити, 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 рити, Рити, бути, забути, просити, лагати, вимагати, плакати, ридати. Як це воно? Оце як це? Це як? Отак. А так. А так. Танк. Тут був танк, а так. Там був танк. А так? Може так. Може бути так. Може бути а так. Психічний а так. Так. Мовчати, спати, спати, спати. Московське время полночь. Kirlana, you're muted. Hi, I'm Virlana Tkach. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> uh, we were at, uh, I wrote this poem a few um, days ago and I'm reading from the East Village. Uh, we were on Zoom just about to start with Anna called for weeks now, my old obsession with theater director Lesh Kurbas was cooking with gas. Three virtual events in three weeks, all before his birthday, February 25th. Each included the curators, Tanya, Valdemar, and me, and focus on one of our exhibitions a few years ago. Kurbas in Kiev described how the concept arose, the archival material that supported it, and how it all transformed into the visual design. A week later, Kurbas in Kharkiv expanded to include the Berezil shows in Kharkiv as Meller's design for Hello, This is Radio 477 rose to fill the Ermilov Center to the ceiling. It took our breath away. It had taken months to build in the basement in Kiev. Zhenya had led the effort of volunteers who learned to calculate the curves and burn, bend the metal by hand into these glowing arcs. Now, Zhenya had to tell us how he turned a few old photographs into this amazing structure. Jana, Olesha, and Tanya described the public events that packed our exhibition day and night. People came from Kiev, came to see it, including Olesha, who invited us to create Kurva's New Worlds at the Arsenal, the premier venue in Ukraine. Standing at one end of the left wing, you could barely make out the other wall. We had several meetings. We hammered out visuals and how to describe our plans that had, and how our plans turned into the technical specifications. It, he showed us the 3D tour of the architectural plan. Anna brought thick volumes of charts and paperwork that became the official tender. And then there were the photographs of the exhibition itself, truly beyond words. We were on Zoom just about to start when Anna called to say Olesha could not join us. I was taken aback. And then I read her statement. This morning, Russia launched a full-scale war against Ukraine. I called Zvinya, could she read Olesha's text? We began our virtual event and I heard Zvinya say, this morning, Russia launched a full-scale war against Ukraine. But actually, all I heard were the hopes and dreams of all the people who'd worked on these exhibitions, of all the artists who'd inspired them. This morning, as Tichina wrote his poems in Kiev in 1918, as Kurba staged his shows in Kharkiv at the Berezil, as Khvelovy pulled the trigger in 1933. Russia once again launched a full-scale war 
against Ukraine. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Olena Jennings, Lila de la Borja, Kristina Lutsenko, Stash Lutsky, Oksana Lutsichna, Zvinya Orlovska, Maria Revakovic, and Oksana Rosenblum for joining us today. Thank you, Martin Nikola, for running our tech. And a big thank you to sponsors, New York State uh, Council on the Arts and New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and Self-Reliance uh, Foundation. And all our friends at Yara Arts Group. We rely on your support, so we expect you to stay healthy. Tell your friends about our events. They can watch this video and all our past virtual video events on, through links on our website. Our exit music will once again be by Julian Kitasti. I'm Virlana Tkach. Thank you and good night.